Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talk Now Radio. This is your host, Royce the Redneck Radio Men. And joining me today is going to be Gloria Tyler, uh, Taylor Brown. And uh, her co-author, Normandy Ellis, was supposed to be with us tonight. However, she had a, uh emergency out of town and was unable to attend. And I told her that we would go ahead and conduct this with Gloria. And if need be, we can always conduct another one with her in late July, early August, somewhere in that range when I have my next openings. Uh, because right now, quite honestly, I'm behind and I'm trying to catch up and I don't need to get further behind by rescheduling a, a whole entire show if I don't have to. So, uh, she was very nice about this. And at any rate, we got the, uh, the other author sitting right here to answer any questions y'all might have. If y'all have any questions, the call in number is 832-632-7904. And the website, if you want to learn more, is www.normandyellis.com. Now, Gloria, I didn't get your website on there. I wasn't even sure, to be honest with you. Do you have a website? Uh, I have a website, and right now it points to my Facebook page, because I'm on there more often than I am anywhere else. But uh, it's Gloria Taylor Brown. But we do have a website that's for the book. And uh, for the book, it's uh, www.invokingthescribes.com. And uh, our book is Invoking the Scribes of Ancient Egypt. And there is a lot more material on the uh, website, including a lot of photos and other writings that were done. Now, I was reading this book over the course of the last couple of weeks, a little bit at a time. And I noticed that it's really a a compilation of you, Normandy, and I want to guesstimate, I didn't count, 20-some-odd people total over the course of about a two-week tour of Egypt. I went through many of the major sites, if not all of them, and at each site, uh, y'all each wrote your thoughts or um, meditations or, you know... um, Something of importance or prayers about that site that could also be written anywhere else. They don't have, you don't have to actually be in Egypt to do it. Am I getting this correct? You're correct. We had with us 17 people, and they all contributed to the book. Um, the um, what we did is we. Normandy wanted to write a particular book, which was a a book of creating um, a personal spiritual journal. journal. And I wanted to go to Egypt and get the boat for as long as possible, the Afendina. So we came up with a scheme where we would be on the Afendina for 10 days and do our writing um, while we were traveling on the Nile. Now, the Afendina is is this glorious 156-foot Dahabeya, which is a boat like the barges that Cleopatra sailed on. Only it also has a 62-inch television and satellite ump link. So, Not uh, exactly roughing it on the high sea. Oh, no, nothing like We had a chef on there that made food for everybody, including the gluten-free, vegan, I-don't-eat-that people. And it seems like more and more you have those people on a tour. So uh, what we did is everyone participated in the uh, exercises and Whenever we came back from Egypt, Normandy and I spent two weeks in Kentucky in the cold December, editing it down from over 800 pages to the pages that appeared in the in the final printed version. And uh, we made sure that every one of our participants was represented, and we made sure that we got the best writing of each one. So everybody gets at least two writings in there, and some of them have more than that. My dear friend Catherine Ravenwood, uh, her writing starts and ends the book because she did the calling in of the directions and the releasing of the directions. Um, I was in charge of bringing in the meditations because um, I have a kind of a short contact list for 
people that I can contact on the other side. And um, Normandy was in charge of uh, making sure that our writing exercises went well. And altogether, we, I, I believe, and this is without the least amount of humility, I believe we created a great book. Well, it, it, I really kind of enjoyed the book, so it must have been a pretty good book. Um, well, that like, makes me sound like I'm awful particular, but uh, I am something of a perfectionist. If I was to be honest, uh, yes, my kids, I drove them crazy. But at any rate, um, it was a um, very interesting to me how y'all put this here book together uh, and the way you told the story. Because what it seemed to me like I was reading was a a mixture of the actual tour itself and what y'all were experiencing during the tour blended in with um, spots all the way through it with the meditations. So you really kind of got two streams of uh, benefit from it rather than just one. Right. Well, we didn't want just a pure travel book. Uh, we wanted, you know, to, to, because we're both, uh, Normandy and I both are completely committed to the mysteries of Egypt. And so we wanted to contain that. We also just love Egypt. Uh, I've been there 12 times. Normandy's been there eight times. Um, we, um, we love the people, the country, and I'm talking about Egypt today, not Egypt 3,000 years ago. So we're, we're having kind of a dual love affair here. Uh, and then on top of that, we really enjoyed the people that came with us. So we wanted to make sure that they had a full experience of Egypt. And, um, so... To allow people to have a picture into what it's like to travel and to travel in this really special way, uh, we wanted to have the travel part in there. And I actually wrote most of that, uh, the, some of that, my writing was all done in Egypt, in Cairo. Uh, we assigned uh, each one of the people, since we had 16 days and more than 16 people, we assigned each day to one person. And for that day, they were the scribe, and they were to record everything that happened. And that's the scribe days that appear in the book, which is each day of the tour. So you have 16 different viewpoints of the same trip. So who was the historical expert that was uh, given all the uh, historical data on the gods like Isis and Hathor and Osiris and Ptah and all the rest of those. Well, Normandy and I are both Egyptologists, so we, we have a strong background in that. And then we also had with us uh, a tour guide uh, who is Emil. 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 Oh, it's Shaker, pronounced Emil. Okay. Uh, who is... Um, He's been doing this for over 30 years, and he's been working with us for over 20 years with Shamanic Journeys. And he knows exactly how, us, how to get us to the temple at right at the right moment so that the, uh, the guards don't tell us we can't do ceremony, because you can't do ceremony in Egypt anymore. And uh, so between us, and the fact we had on the tour, actually, I think there were five or six of the people who'd been to Egypt with us either two or three times before. So, uh, you know, a lot of people that go with us on Shamanic Journeys tours, uh, I know of one woman who's gone seven times. And every time she says it's like no other trip she's ever taken. So you, uh, you and Normandy both, Host these tours periodically. Yes, we do. Um, we work with Nikki Scully, who wrote the foreword to our book, and she owns the company Shamanic Journeys, and uh, she coordinates our entire tours. She also coordinates the tours for a lot of other people, from Gene Houston to anybody else you can think of in the spiritual realm. And we work with Quest Travel in Egypt, which is our beloved Mohammed Nazmi. Okay, I've got your URL for the travel site, and I'm pasting that into the chat room as we speak. Uh, figured y'all could probably use some little attention for that. 
and that's www.shamanicjourney.com. Uh, and you journeys, can learn a, journeys. Make sure it's a plural. Yes. Not sure where it would go if it was a journey. I do stand corrected. That S is on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, shamanicjourneys.com. And uh, if y'all had, don't put that S in, you'll end up at a page cannot be displayed or <laughs> somebody else's site or who knows what. I haven't tried it without the S. I have a, a dear friend who uh, channels angels, and she decided to get the domain name Angel Girl. Well, she found out that the domain Angel Girl was already got, and so she got the Angel Girl. However, she never went to see what Angel Girl was. We did that after she got the domain, and we went, oh, my God, I can't believe, because it was like a major porn site. Oh, no. <laughs> Well, I went to the other one, and it was an, a shaman site, so I'm sure. <laughs> at least it wasn't something uh, like the other one, like you were just mentioning. <laughs> at least it wasn't a porn site, in other words. Well, uh, sometimes you get those shocks, you know, when you're on the Internet. So, roughly, what time of year, and I'm, I'm assuming when I say this, that your uh, journeys or your tours are once a year, what time of year do you normally have your tours? We normally go in late October, early November, and in March. And the reason for that is twofold. One, the weather is still warm enough to be comfortable, but cool enough to not roast your brain. And two, because it's called what's called the shoulder season, when it's a little less expensive to travel in Egypt. Now, are y'all going to be holding... Uh Tours is going to include these writing exercises in the future? We'll have something new and different. New and different. New and different. So that might produce another book. Might produce another book. Or I, what I'm working on personally is video, so I'm looking to produce a, a documentary. Well, you know, after reading this here book, uh, the contents and it could make for a pretty nice uh, documentary especially when y'all were explaining the uh, historical stuff and the stuff about the gods and y'all were right there on the scene you could have cameras at it you could be um, I believe if I remember correctly one of your stops was the Temple of Abydos y'all could film pictures of the ceiling I know it's got hieroglyphs all over the ceilings and the wall there it could make for a great one Yes, I agree, and I wish we'd had a, a video camera with us on that trip. We did have um, a video camera uh, on a trip earlier, and um, we're still waiting to see if that ever comes out. A lady made a movie. Uh, we did have two professional photographers with us, uh, Kathleen Shattuck and Mary Arnett Cremian, And so the photographs that are in the book and on the website are actually uh, professional photograph quality. Um, So my our next goal is to do, um, like I said, I want to do a documentary and I'd like to do to interview um, the people who we're over there with. Um, I've been studying videography for years and that's my next goal. So we're looking at the Goddess Dream Tour as the next one. Well, while you were there at the Temple of Abydos, did you look up at the ceiling and see that? Um, I, I've seen it all over the web. I used to have it on my website. A picture was made of a section of the wall that had hieroglyphs that looked like modern-day tanks and helicopters and Things of that nature. Did you happen to see that? Uh, on the... I know where that is. That's in the section that was built by Ramses II. Um, one of the issues there is it does look an awful lot like a helicopter and a tank. However, Ramses, um, Ramses had a large ego. He had a large family, too. He had 91 sons. Wow, that is large. Uh, he... So whenever he took over Abydos from his father, Seti I, he went back in and he built another out, another part of the building, another part of the temple. And over top of some of the hieroglyphs where his father had beautifully, lovely carved, he went in and very deeply carved his new hieroglyphs. 
Some of these may be where one hieroglyph has been imposed over another one. There are enough strange hieroglyphs there that you don't have to look for trains and planes and automobiles. Uh, there are tra- uh, there are hieroglyphs there that look like someone is holding. Well, you know the the laser wands from Star Wars. You like the lightsabers? Like a lightsaber? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's some hieroglyphs there that look like they're holding a lightsaber with a long cord out, out from it. Um, there's other hieroglyphs that are, um, you know, of, of different beings and examples of what was, you know, they saw as reality at that time that, frankly, they're very strange. Um, the, uh, the temple itself, the temple that, uh, of Abydos that Seti the first uh, constructed, is one of the most beautiful temples, and I adore it. And it's actually constructed in front of the oldest stone building that anyone has ever found up until they found the the thing in Turkey uh, at, uh, what is it, Gobekli Tepe? Gobekli, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's about nine, eight to 9,000 years old. Wow. And it is a place that was supposedly the burial crypt of Osiris. And um, it is, it has no decoration on the walls except for the so-called flower of life, which looks like it was inscribed into these stone walls with a laser. I mean, the precision is incredible. Well, you know, I was also reading online that uh, the Temple of Abydos is uh, kind of like in the big middle of a, a desert-like area, but yet they found a boat uh, buried under the sands upside down in this area where you would not expect to find a boat. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, actually, there's either seven or eight uh, boat burials out there. Uh, One of them they think is about 5,500 years old, which would place it at considerably older than the boats that were uh, buried by the pyramids in Giza. Uh, They have not uh, excavated them because they're waiting for technology to come up to where they can excavate. They only excavated one of them, and it sort of fell apart on them. So rather than excavate the others, they're letting them lay, and they're hoping that at some point they'll be able to go in there uh, with more modern technology and excavate them and manage to get them to stay put. One of the things that's incredible is whenever you go to Giza and, you know, you think about, you know, I'm talking about a 156-foot boat that we sailed down the Nile on. Well, there's a boat that's bigger than that that they buried right beside the pyramid. And it looks sort of the same. And that was done over 5,000 years ago. And 5,000 years ago was not the time that uh, that area was tropical. The time it was tropical was no. 11,000 years ago, I think. Right, yeah. It, no, it was desert at that time. And the other thing is that you, the historians... Uh, claim that Egypt was not an ocean-going um, culture. Well, if they weren't an ocean-going culture, what did they need with a boat that had a high prow and big sails? You know, to go down the Nile, you basically, you know, had something that sailed with the current or got pulled against the current. And the Nile uh, went right into the Mediterranean, so it would be hard to believe they wouldn't just you know, drift right out into the Mediterranean and, and, and go elsewhere they want it to. And there's a lot of things that the historians say that don't necessarily make sense, but because we can't prove the way they we believe them to be, uh, we have to sort of say, okay, well, you know, until we have proof. Um, in Egypt, they they have a term for people like me. They call us pyramidiots. <laughs> That wasn't a very nice turn. Sounds like something Zahi Hawass would come up with. Yeah, well, Zahi's, uh, Dr. Hawass, I've met him several times. He's uh, an interesting man. Um, I will say this for him. Um, 
He has he did more for popularizing archaeology in Egypt than anybody ever has done since Tutankhamun. I've also heard though that he suppresses some of the uh, archaeological finds there that does not match uh, Egypt's uh, version of how things went. That may be so. Uh, he's um, what he does. I wouldn't say he suppresses them, but like I said about the boats, he says this one we'll dig up later when we have more technology, when we know more, and you really don't know what it is he's hiding. Because you know he could dig it up now, and he doesn't want to. Maybe, maybe he's not in charge anymore, so. Uh, what I'm hoping is whoever's in charge now will take as much care with the excavations as he did. Yeah, I would imagine he did take care because Egypt was a, um, well, his home country and it meant a lot to him. In other words, uh, retaining ev- the, um, you know, pristine condition of everything I'm sure was important to him as well as, uh, the histori- uh, the history and everything else. Well, not only that, but, you know, the greatest treasures of Egypt are not in Egypt. They're in London. They're in Munich. They're in Paris. They're in New York. They were basically sold off in the last part, half of the 1800s, the early part of the 1900s, to museums around the world. And um, so they've gotten very protective about it. I mean, to the point that at this point, I don't know if, you know, if you tried to pick up a rock on the ground and carry it out, you might be told to put the rock down. Well, a lot of writers out there, and I'm pretty sure you're familiar with some of them, believe that the uh, pyramids and other major uh, landmarks were laid out like a ground uh, star map of the Orion uh, constellation. You actually got a chance to see that. What do you think? Well, I do believe that, and I also don't believe that the pyramids were ever a tomb. I believe that they were a um, a place that the priesthood went to be ordained, that there was a ceremony. I mean, there's, there's some things that just don't make sense. Uh, the sarcophagus in the Great Pyramid is too big to get in through the door that you have to go into to, in order to get into the, the Grand Chamber, the King's Chamber, as they call it. So it had to be built in place, which well, is mind-boggling. There are people out there who believe, and I think his name is Mark Myler is one of them, if I'm not mistaken. I've had him on my show. Uh, that believed that this was really meant for initiation, that in fact the uh, limestone <clears throat> has similar, pardon me, <clears throat> I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Has similar uh, properties to uh, quartz that are attuned for energy and music and sound that uh, help with the process of initiation. Right. Yeah, I I believe that. I'll tell you a story about uh, one time when we were at Saqqara, which is the oldest of the pyramids. It's the so-called step pyramid. And we were down below in the crypt. And I had been there several times. And so I had volunteered to be the person who stayed back up by the door to turn the lights on when it was time to turn the lights back on. And so I was not participating in the meditation or anything else. And they had gone on down to the the center of the area. And so I'm just sort of sitting there and watching. And all of a sudden, these sparks of light start flashing around. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, well, Nikki must be doing something with flashlights because there's these sparks of light. And then I hear this... um, at first monotone and then duotone uh, chanting. And it goes on and on and on. And I think, well, they're, you know, they're chanting down in the, in the tomb. And um, finally, Nikki signals to me that I should turn the light on. 
And when she came up, I says, what were you chanting? She says, we weren't chanting. We weren't making a sound. I said, well, what about the lights? What were you doing with the lights down there? She says, there were no lights. I said, there were lights and there was chanting. And I wasn't having a psychic moment. I was having a physical moment. Hmm. And you never did figure out what it was? I presume it was the pyramid singing. And, you know, it was... It was obviously, um, I mean, the pyramids heat, they cool, but it was, it was, it sounded like voices chanting two different tones. Hmm. And the Great Pyramid, if you go into the Great Pyramid, you go into the, to the King's Chamber, and you do sound in there. I mean, Halprin's done recordings in there. The sound is so magnified. It's just incredible. It, 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 it like bounces off the walls at you. And it does. The, the pyramid itself seems to vibrate. So, yeah, I believe they are incredible machines. And we have not discovered in our tiny little minds how to use them. Well, I know I was reading in your book that when you laid down inside of the uh, sarcophagus, you had a sudden feel of energy going through you, uh, you know, giving you a heightened experience of sorts. Is this somehow connected to what you uh, might have been thinking about the sound and everything? It might have been. I, I've been in the sarcophagus now 11 times, and every time it is transformational. Uh, it doesn't seem like it should be. It's just a big stone box after all. Uh, and it's not easy to get in, and it's not easy to get out of. But uh, um, it is somehow there's some energy there that, you know, I've had reports of people seeing angels. I've had reports of people seeing their grandmother. Um, I personally see light, uh, dancing lights, uh, gods and goddesses. So, I don't know. It may be what you bring there becomes ma uh, magnified. All I know is it is an incredible experience, and it should be on everybody's life list. Well... Is there a is there mark something? Yeah, sorry. I live on a street where cars don't drive down, so it's always a shock whenever there's any um, noise. I apologize. That's okay. I also notice I heard myself for a minute, but I, I don't hear myself again now, so it's okay. Um, I was going to – I had a question on top of my – oh, another thing I read in the book that really got my attention, and I forget who it was that told it. It might have been you, the story about the uh, Turtle Island and Turtle Woman. Mm-hmm. Um. I found that to be unusual because this is a book about Egypt and experiences in Egypt, and Turtle Island is a Cherokee legend. Um, that was something that was written by Nettie Ed Eldridge, who is a Cherokee, um, ah. and uh, that was her experience, and it was her writings and whether it was her writings about whenever she was in this country, America is Turtle Island. So, whether it was that or not, uh, I don't know. It was well written. I do know that. It was also kind of lengthy. <laughs> it's kind of hard to edit some of this stuff. I think you've done an excellent job. Um, but, yeah, she had a very interesting story in there. Of course, me being Cherokee, it got my attention. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm part Cherokee as well, so uh, my grandfather's a full blood. Now, when did this book come out on the market exactly? 11, 11, 2011. Really? Really. That is very interesting because 11, 11, 11 was something that people have been uh, talking about. When the date come around, 
in connection with awakening and spiritual mm-hmm. advancement. And uh, that exact day, I interviewed um, 